Today, I'm delighted to speak with Adam Schwartz from Dirtcraft Organics. Adam has a background in farming. He saw the gap in the potting soil market in his area of North Carolina. He's filled this niche by blending and bagging potting soils and shipping in the Southeast. Today, we get to hear about the equipment he's using, the challenges he's come across, and the exciting news about starting up his new compost operation. Welcome to The Composter, a podcast for compost lovers. I'm your host and fellow composter, Jane Murner. Join me in practical conversation between industry professionals and farmers with a passion for producing quality compost. We're going to dig deep into the science, technology, and art of compost production so that we as composters can help enliven the world's soils. This episode of The Composter is brought to you by Viably. As the master distributor of Comtech products in North America, Viably helps their customers to uncover the most forward-thinking solutions in the waste and recycling industry, including the proven four-step Comtech compost process of shred, turn, screen, and separate, which produces healthy, contaminant-free compost while optimizing commercial production efficiency. Viably is also the distributor of the Turbo Separator Food Waste Depackaging System and the Harp Renewables Biodigester. Both of these revolutionary machines can help composters incorporate food scraps into their compost process, creating a more nutritious end product and the opportunity for an enhanced bottom line. You can learn more about Viably and their portfolio of compost solutions at thinkviably.com. While there, request a complimentary consultative meeting to discover how Viably can help your compost operation deliver what is possible. When it comes to buying a truck, you don't look for parts and try to build it yourself. You want something ready to ride. So why settle for parts when it comes to your farm management? In a world filled with parts vendors, Farmhand is the only all-in-one virtual assistant built by and for farmers. With one single platform, Farmhand enables you to offload your administrative tasks, send and manage communications, and sell more to your customers. The best part? Farmhand's ready-to-ride platform comes with zero startup costs or long-term commitments. Ready to earn more and work less? Take Farmhand's ready-to-ride solutions for a spin. Learn more and book a free test drive at farmhand.partners slash no-till. That's farmhand.com. That partners slash no till. Enjoy the show. Hey, Adam, welcome to the composter. Thanks for being on. Hi, yeah, I'm great. Glad to be here. Can you tell us about Dirtcraft Organics? I've been hearing so much about it, where you're located, and how you got started. Yeah, so uh, Dirtcraft Organics, we're a small uh, craft soil blender based in Western North Carolina. We focus on peat free potting soils. Um, so we're blending compost, um, cocoa coir barks, amendments, fertilizers, minerals, uh, blending up potting soils and shipping out to farmers and gardeners here in Western North Carolina, but also throughout the Southeast. We ship a lot of soil to Tennessee, Georgia, Virginia, um, nurseries and farms. And then we have about 50 retailers who sell our bag products. Awesome. And how did you get started? I started composting. um, I was running a farm up in Maryland, uh, maybe 2010 or so. It was a nonprofit farm. We were doing a lot of compost education. We were doing worm castings um, at a pretty decent scale. This was right around when um, like micro hauling became a thing and folks were collecting food waste and uh, they were bringing it to our farm. We would compost it and teach workshops. And through that, I ended up um, starting a composting company. This is up in Maryland where I grew up and uh, doing commercial scale composting um, up in the Baltimore area for a number of years before I needed to kind of do a reset and relocate to a rural rural farm location, which is really what I was passionate about. And so we um, moved down to Western North Carolina, just outside of Asheville. Um, so our farm is got 24 acres, about 30 minutes outside of Asheville. And um, we were like, hey, let's start composting down here and kind of realized there's a lot of barriers to entry to getting into composting with land access and permits and things along that line. And so we kind of got diverted into doing potting mixes because we saw there was a big need for it. There's a lot of farmers who were sourcing potting mix from up in New England or out in California, or they were mixing their own really inefficiently on their farm or 
or they were using like more commercial mixes that are intended um to, you know more inert mixes that they weren't getting the performance that they wanted from it so we kind of ended up becoming a potting mix blender and um now here we are five years in and we're finally um building a composting facility kind of come full circle i just saw that on instagram how exciting where where's the compost facility how far from your current place it's literally next door so we ended up buying the seven acres next door so that so it's like up the up on the ridge whereas we're down in the bowl um here in the mountains nothing's flat uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and topography is a big you know challenge or, around the site design so we've ended up um doing engineering and you know jumping through lots of different hoops in order to make it happen but um our intention is to do a, a smaller scale composting facility where we can focus on a on quality over quantity. Mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of the, um, especially my past experience in the composting industry has been more of the waste management kind of mindset. And so making that pivot has been one of our main principles. That's exciting. Do you have like a, a month amount of tonnage per week you're going to be permitted to take in or what are you going for? Yeah, we'll be taking in about 20 tons per week of food scraps pre-consumer so we're doing what's it's called a type 2 compost facility i don't know every state's a little different with their rules what are the good inputs around your area for like i'm I'm sure there's food scraps but what about like carbon anything else any exciting like manures or anything like that yeah you know Asheville's not a big metro area so and we're not near the coast there's not a ton of inputs that are super exciting we're mainly there's a lot of food and beverage kind of manufacturers so that pre-consumer food waste there's a lot of residuals from breweries there's a lot of breweries who've relocated here because we have excellent water Mm. so that's a big piece of it for us we're not going to be taking in manures actually Um, that's part of that type 2 permit but just out of an abundance of caution with persistent herbicides and they seem to bioaccumulate in the in the manures Uh, i feel like uh, especially down here in the south every hay field is sprayed with grazon or something along those lines and it's a challenge. And, you know, there is a big forestry industry down here in the South in general. Um, and But that kind of makes it hard to source wood waste because there's contracts. Um, there's In our town, there's a, a railroad going through and it's not uncommon to see just rail cars of wood chips going one way or another, you know, up to Bristol to the incinerator, down to the paper mill. The, the paper mill recently closed and I was hoping, you know, it'd be a lot easier to get wood chips, but we're still, we're still kind of um, working through the sourcing and identifying you know we haven't really opened yet so it's out there to be had when did you purchase the land and like how long do you think the permitting is going to take we bought the land last august Um, we got our permit in the spring and we've been building 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 all summer and trying to get through that push in our slow season is our busy season for the potting mixes is really december through june okay Um, and then we kind of slow down i mean we're still shipping Mm. Got a truckload of soil going to Virginia today, but um, nowhere near as busy as we are other times of the year. So we're trying to focus all our attention on getting that facility up and running. Well, that permitting process actually doesn't sound as long as a lot of other people I'm talking to. Yeah, I had to crack the whip uh, (laughs) to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) There's many an evening spent at a planning board meeting. uh, Yeah, yeah. And it was mostly a town challenge or state challenge? It was both. There were different hoops, different hurdles, but yeah. I had no intention of talking to you about this, but I'm just fascinated because I'm going through the same thing. So. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people out there are. Okay, great. Are there a lot of composters around you? What's the competition like for, for composters there? Because of the topography, there's not a ton of composters in this part of the state compared to the Eastern Triangle part of, the, of North Carolina. Just between what's flat enough to operate equipment uh, but also isn't in a floodplain. Um, and there's a lot of development, new development in our area. It's a, it's a tourist town and a lot of folks are showing up to build their second, third homes. And so you've got to compete against that. We've, we've seen, since we moved here about 10 years ago, we've seen the raw land prices probably triple. Um, and so it's, it's a challenge to, I, to have the right site. So there are some other composters that are pretty small. There was a, Atlas Organics was, was hauling food waste from Asheville all two and a half hours down into South Carolina at one point because there weren't enough, there wasn't enough capacity here in this area. Now that operation has recently closed down. And so there's big gaps at this point. 
many, many farms, I know I've been in this situation where you start off kind of small and you're making your own potting soil and your wheelbarrow and it's not that big of a deal. And then suddenly you grow and it's such a pain to make potting soil for yourself at like at the farm scale, especially as you get to be like three acres, five acres growing up that way and get all the inputs to put in. And then how do you mix it? The shovel doesn't work anymore. So you are (laughs) definitely filling a niche there that it was so needed. Um, Can you talk about the equipment you're using for blending and uh, like what that, you know, what does that look like? So we, um, we bring in all the raw materials, you know, on walking a floor trucks or pallets of fertilizers that, you know, we're storing and unloading in our facility here. And then we actually bucket blend a base mix. That's kind of the base of all of our different products uh, with a wheel loader in like a contained covered bay. So we're, we're mixing the bulk ingredients first and then we load them into a um, horticultural mixer, sometimes called a ribbon mixer. Um, and that's the point at which we're adding the perlite or the rice hull, the aeration component, the mineral, um, the fertilizer, um, you know, all the things you really want perfectly mixed so that you don't have pockets of fertility in your potting soil. And we let it uh, mix for four to five minutes before loading it into, you know, all of our soils, everything that leaves the farm is bagged in some sort or another. We do not, um, sell loose scoops of material. And part of the reason for that is that after it comes out of that mixer, it's coming off a conveyor belt and directly into some form of bag. I had this problem when I was I was experimenting with the different machines. It would like break the material down almost too much, like um, homogenize it and then like make the pieces smaller. It sounds like that four to five minutes is maybe the right amount of time. So you're not getting like a really super fine material. I don't know if you had that experience at all, or if that was just unique to me. Yeah, some of that has to do with the water content, the moisture content, okay, the density. Um, we do have variations to our recipes if you know if it's a wetter or mm. um, if if it, when we do bagging, the material may stay in the mixer a little longer, so we're adding a little bit more perlite to overcompensate for that. But yeah, there's kind of a a right amount of time, and if you let it stay in there too long, it would happen. Yeah, it's going to be nice for you to have. It seems like compost is the most variable of the ingredients that you'd be blending. And so that's going to be nice for you to have that control with your new site. Have you had challenges with compost coming in before of just being inconsistent or, you know, different textured or? We have. um, I was on the North Carolina Compost Council for a number of years and, and made friends with other composters in the state. And then we were sourcing an army listed compost that we were very happy with. And And that company ended up changing hands and then the quality dropped. And so we've ended up switching and uh, we got in a compost now that's armory listed and it's pre-consumer and we're happy with it. But, you know, we're trucking it in from a lot further away than we'd like at this point. Yeah. So that's going to be a great um, streamlining process for you once that you're all worked out. And then I saw so you're bagging everything. And I think you have different types of bags, different sizes for sure. I know you have the sling bags that are like that woven poly. Um, is that right? Yeah, they're one cubic yard um, super sacks, essentially. And they're, is that right, right that they're woven poly? I'm like, yep. yeah, okay. And I saw that you're recycling them. Yeah, we accept. We I just have a, a bin out at our gate where, where folks can drop them off. Uh, we'll take them back. When the early, early days, we would try to um, sanitize them and reuse them um, in-house. But we kind of quickly felt like that was a bottleneck and we were um, not feeling like we could get them as sanitized. They, sometimes they'd show up filthy, you know, and sometimes they'd show up pristine. And we decided out of, uh, you know, we have a lot of commercial growers. We didn't want to send in high-end product in a dirty old bag um, so we, um, we just have them for at this point we're back stocking them for other purposes um, especially okay. once we get into doing a compost we may end up um, for local accounts like offering a discounted product in a used bag or something but we haven't really started using them yet so how do you fill those big ones uh, it comes off a conveyor belt and just kind of empties in to the uh, to the top of the bit of the bag. They're on a pallet. They're on a pallet already. Yep. Cool. All right. And then the smaller bags. What are what's the material of the smaller bags that you're shipping out? It's the same material. It's like a feed, a feed or seed bag. Um, it's like a, a woven poly that has a um, some kind of membrane on it, so it doesn't dry out too too quickly. Uh, I mean, it ends up in a retail like 
establishment that's a conditioned into our space and can dry out too fast. Um, so we've experimented with all the options and done one we're happy with. But uh, we we also fill that right off a conveyor. We have a foot pedal. It's not very co- it's not very fancy. Yep. Um, there's lots of specialized equipment, but we don't have the amps to run a lot more big motors than than we already are, and uh, or the space. And so that's what we do for now. Join me and composters from around the country at Compost 2025 in Phoenix, Arizona, January 27th to the 30th, where industry leaders gather to revolutionize composting. Don't miss keynote speaker Stephanie Katsaros, president of Brightbeat, a Chicago-based organization sharing insights on advancing environmental stewardship and social change. Network with professionals, attend workshops, and explore the latest innovations in composting. Register now at compostconference.com and use coupon code NOTILL for 10% off. See you there. Oh yeah, it's seed browsing season and High Mowing Organic Seeds is releasing 66 new seed varieties for 2025 on November 1st. These beautiful and productive vegetable, flower, and herb varieties are 100% organic and non-GMO and trialed for optimal performance in organic growing systems. Whether you're trying to bring your best to your CSA, wholesale customers, or to the farmer's market, High Mowing has the professional quality seeds and supportive grower reps to get you from seed to harvest. Visit highmowingseeds.com to request a catalog and use NOTILL25, all caps, for 10% off your order of $100 or more. And now back to the show. So it comes off the ribbon mixer on a conveyor into the bagging machine with the foot pedal or... It just comes right off of a conveyor into a, we had a welder, a local welder, a custom welder little chute that the bags fit on and then a foot pedal to operate the conveyor and it just sends it up and in. Do you have someone holding, like, like I need to picture it. <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, their ba- the, ba- the bag itself is resting on a crate. It's a produce crate. Okay. And um, that way they're not holding the weight of the, ba- of the bag as it fills up, but then they just send it to the next guy who sews it up and stacks it. Okay, so it can be two people. It's yeah, two people, John. Sure. Yeah, we have something similar. We have that go bagger, and uh, there's one person doing the foot pedal, and then send it off, and then one person seals it and puts it on the stacks it. Ours is also archaic and like <laughs> needs, needs tweaking. <laughs> yeah, uh, we found they stack better if you overfill them, so that's kind of what we've tended to do. And you do it by weight or by volume? It's volume. Volume, yeah. That's the, the safer way with the different varying texture of the compost and moisture content and stuff. Okay, great. And then you put them on a pallet. You wrap the pallets, I assume, with the, with, for the smaller bags. We do. Yeah, it's shrink-wrapped. And, um, and then we have trucks come pick it up at the end of our driveway. Okay. And do you have your own trucks? We do. We deliver, um, we deliver like up to 100 miles. So that's... Most of Western North Carolina, a little bit of Eastern Tennessee, and into uh, upstate South Carolina. But that's that's the extent of it. Uh, everything outside of that, we will ship out. So, and, and you know, f- freight and logistics is a big challenge for small. You know, a lot of our customers are small family farms. They may have a compact tractor, you know, if they're lucky, and sometimes they don't even have that. And so, figuring out the the freight uh, to get it to the to their farm um with the right combination of lift gate or whatnot is, is a big challenge it's something that we spend a lot of time working on so that we can make sure folks can get our soils yeah it's such a pain like we even have garden centers that don't have the capability to get a pallet off a truck and um man it's so such a head scratcher i go back and forth like do we get one of those machines with the, the i call it a spider that can a little tractor on the machine that can take the pallet off, but it's a whole nother giant rig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, so you've got the same challenges. Hmm. <laughs> Is that your biggest <laughs> yeah. challenge? What's your biggest challenge right now in your in your realm today? I'm sure it varies on day to day. Yeah, the, the the freight logistics is probably the biggest ongoing challenge because it's just never ending. We have had supply chain issues over the years you know this year's been pretty knock on wood's been pretty eventless um with that but in the years past we have trouble sourcing different ingredients it was so hard during covid have you tapped into the railroad at all like for shipping stuff i've like i've never explored that but it sounds like you're really close to it no we haven't um i that seems too mysterious to me. To <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, that's cool. All right. So I, I'm seeing the, the big picture here. So I've, I've struggled with peat moss because we're really close actually to like where you can source peat in Maine and Canada, where you are not as close, but Quar is not close. I can't like the shipping of the Quar, which I've been experimenting with is like, wow, it's coming from like Sri Lanka. Um, so that's been adding a whole nother thing, but are you using those pine bark finds from the South that I haven't got, been able to get my hands on, but I hear they're a great alternative for peat? We are. Yeah. Um, pine's been, um, uh, media for the horticulture industry here in the South forever. Okay. Um, and it's, it's great growing media. Um, you know, it's not the primary ingredient in our mixes, but it does help. Um, to balance out, you know, we started from day one doing peat-free mixes. That was kind of the niche that we saw not being offered in the market. Um, and that was important to us um, just from kind of a climate change uh, perspective with the emissions and peat moss and um, peatlands being, you know, the, one of the, it is the biggest, uh, I believe, terrestrial carbon source on the planet. Um, and desire to kind of keep those ecosystems intact. Um, and so for us, Coco Core was the first go-to to, to investigate and trial back when we first were getting started. And we still, it's just still a major ingredient in all our products. Um, you know, the, the Dutch have been using Coco Core forever in, in horticulture. And um, yeah, it comes from far away. It has like a six to one compression. So you think about that compared to whatever the compression of peat moss is. I've spent time trying to like calculate carbon emissions and, you know, you can go down that, that rabbit hole. But um, for us being peat free was an important um, kind of mindset to center the business around and um, what we focus on. Now, a lot of growers um, switching over from peat to cocoa, they have to kind of recalibrate some of their watering techniques because it is going to hold water. Um, it's more efficient at holding water. You're going to have um, just generally less need to water. Um, but that that also means folks can overwater them. And so over time, we've got better at tweaking our mixes so that it performs as close as possible to, um, to more of the conventional peat-based mixes that a lot of folks are used to. You can feel so good about making compost and supporting the compost industry. And then all the additions, all the fertilizers and everything that goes into it, it's hard to feel good about. I have really, <laughs> I'm really scratching my head about how to feel good about our blends. You know, when I'm like, oh, the compost is so amazing. And then all this extraction business around it is challenging. And we just have to sort of accept that. We live in this world with trade-offs. <laughs> Everything's a trade-off. I feel good about the customers that are using our products and, and the good that they're doing in the world. And, and that. Um, and it's getting back into the earth. Like it's, absolutely. you know, it's going back into the ground and doing its good carbon sequestration again in the ground. The land I just bought for the compost operation is on a gravel bank for, you know, it's, ex it's an, ex we're extracting gravel and I'm doing that until I can get the compost set up. But, um, I, I hadn't thought about that industry so much. I mean, we're just scooping out of the ground. It's so weird. <laughs> Instead of like, I'm just used to this this operation where we we make a material. This is just like taking. I don't know. It's, that's weird. Uh -huh. I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> we also um, kind of tying in the peat alternatives to the supply chain stuff. When there was a, a while back um, when we couldn't get cocoa coir, I guess no one was getting mm -hmm. intermodal freight because the supply chain stuff. And we just started looking, you know, expanding our search, looking at all the alternatives. And we actually found a, another bark based product. It's a wood fiber that's uh, made here in North Carolina. It's actually like 90 miles from us that we um, started trialing. It took a couple, a couple years of grow trials, um, mainly to work through the, the logistics of their, the way it's compressed, it needs to be decompressed, but we've been very happy with the results of that. And that actually ended up last year being a, um, included in all of our mixes. There was a product that I found a sample of that I, I would love to be expanded upon. It was glass put under high pressure and it was so much like perlite, but it was just recycled glass. And um, it was a company in Vermont and they're not in business anymore, but the product was awesome. They were mostly using it for like fish tank things. 
um, uh, aeration, but I saw such a good use for it in our industry. It wasn't sharp. It was just this, like almost like pumice. Um, and, um, yeah, so if anybody out there listening wants to develop that, that would be amazing for this mixing operation. Cause the, you know, the perlite, the, all the vermiculite, all those things are like a little bit, um, they're tough to, um, when you, when you really look into how they're made and all the things, but yeah. They're energy in- intensive to manufacture. Yeah. yeah. But they are a great aeration material. So we'll keep honing it in. And I love that you're like exploring and trying the new things. That's awesome. So this is the next question. What is the one tool on your operation that you can't live without? It would be like your desert island compost tool <laughs> <laughs> or bagging, mixing yeah, tool, whatever way. <laughs> totally. I, I was going to say our front end loader because that um, feels so obvious Yeah. Uh, how indispensable it is. But I was really thinking of probably our, our greenhouse here uh-huh. on the farm because um, it's really where we do all the R&D and the trialing and, and get our hands in the product and actually grow all our own seedlings and we're always potting up or doing some kind of experiment or trial. And to me, that feels like um, touching grass and, and kind of um, keeping what we're doing relevant and um, having that quality control and not, not just being like a manufacturer only. Yeah. Um, That's great. I can't, I can't see our operation without the greenhouse is like right in the middle of our, of our whole operation. And it feels like a, um, it's also kind of, my happy place where I end up spending a lot of my time. It's awesome because you, you've got to trial so many different things because you can't just trial one crop. You've got to know, do the brassicas right. work in this as well as, you know, the tomatoes and the flowers and the cannabis and all the things. So yeah, that's really important. You, are you the one doing the growing or do you have a, someone behind that? It's usually me. It's mostly me. Yeah. I'm doing less sitting on the loader these days. Okay. That's good for your body. Is there anything else you want to let our listeners know, particularly like those small farm composters that are wanting to, you know, it's nice to be able to sell a little bit of our product. Is it worth us getting into this bagging and blending? (laughs) Too much of a headache. Is it a specialty thing? (laughs) Or anything else you want our listeners to know? Yeah, I think the world needs more composters. And I think small farmers are like the perfect group of folks to kind of fill that that need and your region and um you know the bagging piece of it doesn't always make sense for every every person but um you know i think we're excited to kind of finally come full circle with opening our compost facility and we're always trying to to network with other composters especially other composters in the south and kind of make those connections and something i've always loved about this industry and um I've really uh, appreciated following you and and seeing um, kind of how you guys are this intergenerational family business. And I've always kind of felt this affinity to a lot of our customers who are family um, farms, family businesses, and you know seeing that and it's cool to like listen to that interview you did with your dad. And you know, oftentimes I have my son on my lap while I'm loading a customer. And think about you building that for for your next generation is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Getting more rooted. Yeah. And there's something so you cannot put a price tag on just being raised in the industry as just part of you. You learn so much that way, Um, even when you don't know you're learning. So it's like just a a deeper seated understanding of things. So it's so awesome. You're bringing that to your family. And it sounds like you didn't grow up farming. That's what I I, I don't know if that's true, but. No, I I grew up in the suburbs. I would say uh, just a idealistic young guy who wanted to work on farms and ended up for whatever reason or another like making my way being attracted towards soils and compost yeah i bet that's most people listening to this so that's very relatable yeah well i so appreciate your time adam that was excellent there's a lot of good information in here are we going to see you at um the compost conference this year in uh, january and Arizona? Uh, I try to go when they have it on the East Coast. I don't know if I'm going to make it out. Okay. Um, that's our busy season, so. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. do a lot of the farming conferences, so it's my focus. Yeah, and then you can do that. I mean, because it's probably summer is your slower time. <laughs> Late summer, fall, like now. Yeah, yeah, now. Okay. Well, enjoy your slow season then. <laughs> <laughs> And I appreciate you. I can't wait to catch up and see how the new site is going in in a you know a year or so. Rings 
How cool to hear about Adam's journey from farmer to blender bagger and soon to be a mid-sized compost operator. I'll be following Adam as he grows, and I hope you do too, on Instagram at Dirtcraft Organics or DirtcraftOrganics.com. Thank you for sharing your story with us, Adam. As always, thank you to No-Chill Growers for making this possible. All of our sponsors, the awesome music of Soul Shot, Mother Earth, Ja, Buddha, God, or whatever allows for this fun career, and especially you, our compost-loving listeners. 